You're listening to the Autism Weekly Podcast. Each week we share community voices and bring light to stories that increase awareness, acceptance, equity, access, and inclusion. If you haven't already, subscribe to join the Autism Weekly family. I'm your host, Jeff Skibitsky. This week, we're joined by Dr. Eric Larson, who's the Executive Director of Clinical Services at the Lovas Institute Midwest. He's also a licensed psychologist and a board-certified behavior analyst doctoral level. With extensive experience in autism intervention, he's currently researching high-intensity early intensive behavioral intervention programs. Dr. Eric Larson, president of the Association for Science and Autism Treatment, actively advocates for increased ABA service access. Join us for a discussion on the impact of research and advocacy in ABA therapy for autism. Dr. Eric Larson, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Jeff. It's good to see you again. Yeah, it's nice to see you as well. I always enjoy these conversations. And um, obviously, is that we've already talked before, and I, I, I know how your passion started in autism, but I'm, I'm more intrigued of where your, your balance of the research level, because you work for the Lobos Institute, and uh, Dr. Ivar Lobos was one of the, the big names of getting ABA and autism aligned with a lot of heavy research. Where did your passion come in, in the, the practice of research within the field? That's kind of an interesting question because when I started as an undergraduate in the 1970s in this field, I started because the professor at my undergraduate school was the State University of New York of Cortland. And one of my professors, his name was Bob Lear, L-E-H-R, he adopted a son who turned out to have autism and was severely affected by his autism. And because of that, he was already a behavioral psychologist doing research with uh, pigeons. And because he knew about Lovas, he called up Lovas and said, um, what do I do? And Lovas said, well, he's gonna need round the clock therapy and there's no funding for it. So the thing to do, I could just imagine hearing Ivar and I can't really imitate Norwegian very well, but the thing to do is to have a practicum class where you can have your own students work with your child. So Lear jumped on it, um, organized this practicum class uh, in the process, was recruited um, Paul Leiben, who was a student of John Bailey's in Florida State, and um, some other psychologists there in the department were all behaviorally oriented, and they put together a practicum program for autism. So I, what I really credit the whole growth of our field is to the leadership of parents. Um, so obviously Catherine Maurice in the 1990s um, publicized what we do at Lovas widely right back when the internet was first becoming used by the lay public. There was a listserv called the me list uh, people desperately trying to um, figure out what to do about autism you know before even the big growth in numbers of autism and they were all very very focused on her book that she had published in 1993 called let me hear your voice and she's just to me, it's her and then Lori Unum and Dan Unum in the 2000s and other many other parents. I won't try to name them all right now. Um, the only reason I'm working in the field is because they worked hard to make sure families could access treatment and even know about it in the case of Maurice and even do anything in the case of Bob Lear back in the 1970s. Um, and because of this parent-led movement and all my close work in the homes with parents, um, I get all my direction and all my interest in how to frame what we do based on the parent's point of view. And then circle all the way back to Bob Lear. He's both a scientist and he's a parent. And so I kind of got it 
the the two different versions of what we should be doing with kids coming from one voice, which was Bob's. And he was just very a very inspiring guy, um, very much wanted to help him work with his uh, child and um, still think to this day about um, what we could have done, what we could have done much better with you know, no funding, just cobbling it all together and what really would matter to a family versus what should a scientist do. I love I love the fact that all those influences came into kind of the, the foundation that you have right now. It's when I look at the history, it it started with those decisions. It started with us being able to say, OK, how do we apply this to specific um, phenotypes? How do we how do we take the science and apply it to behavior in general? Like the big questions we put out there. But I think that the parents have challenged us not only on the access issue, but also on, you know, where do we continue to look to strengthen the science and the delivery of care? Um, what sort of influence do you think that this research, this passion driven by parents, has led to some of the policy changes over time? Just to give us a little bit of, you know, I guess, background before we start talking about the details of today's topic on how policy evolves and what that process looks like. Yeah, well, once again, it's the leadership of parents. You just can't separate the role of the parents from everything we do. I go back to, yeah, I, in the 1970s, I was sort of on the, the end of the deinstitutionalization movement. So the families in the 19, 50s and 60s had already been working to address the abuses of the institutional approach to helping people. And um, those families were the people testifying, were the people organizing what used to be called the Association for Retarded Children. Now it's just the ARC. Um, and um, the Autism Society of America had its roots in a group of families who were inspired by their own children, by their needs, but they also had heard about what Lovas was doing in the 1960s and specifically uh, formed a group to promote access to behavioral services. And without their efforts, um, Sullivan in West Virginia and um, Rimland in LA um, without their efforts. And then you just see parent after parent after parent, any year, any era you go to, you see parents who were clearly in the forefront of making things happen. Um, just, just yesterday, I was just pointing out, so someone was asking me, well, where did this new funding program come from in Minnesota? And I said, well, Governor Mark Dayton, who had a nephew with autism, <laughs> put his weight behind it. And it's again and again and again, you look everywhere, you, you look at the Unums, just their parents. And they're, they're people that are making things happen because they get it. And if, if we simply relied on a committee of policymakers to sit down and do a needs assessment and fashion uh, a program from the standpoint of professionals, you wouldn't have the heart and you wouldn't have the drive and you wouldn't have the uh, the level of effort at implementation that, that the parents bring to the table. I agree that lived experience and being able to share that perspective, I mean, that's uh, insurmountable when you're when you're trying to be able to look at the impact that one feels when they're going through the journey. And that illuminates what we need to be doing better, what we need to be looking at, what we need to fund. Um, but you did mention, I mean, that there are these committees of policymakers. They, they're they influenced by the families, but they have to default back to what's hopefully evidence-based in their decision-making. Um, and that's where I think that, I mean, there's so many inputs out there. And there's so many groups that are out trying to better the field by looking at new research questions. Um, but then there's there's sometimes where the research just might not stand up yet. 
and you can't put it up at the same level as those that have been replicated and, and have enough of a sample size for us to be able to evaluate. Um, when you're looking at that process, I know your background and, and your research passion has been on the early intensive side. Can you give us just some of the, the blanket history for the listeners as far as, you know, this is where policy started from. It started from a, a plethora of research and, and follow-up studies to be able to justify that the treatment itself is valuable in helping autistics and their families to be able to reach their, uh, I wouldn't say potential, but be able to contribute in the way that they want to. Yes. Um, you know, families, they're desperate. They're often the families who are the real leaders in these efforts. They're living with serious challenges with their own children and fears for their future on a daily basis. And they're they're going to grasp at any straw. And they're not trained scientists. You know, unlike uh, Bob Lear, uh, one of my mentors, um, he was a trained scientist, so he was going straight to the ABA. Um, and then a lot of the effort um, from Catherine Maurice, who actually was part of the founding of the Association for Science and Autism Treatment, which I'm I'm the current president of, um, she and other parents founded that because it was so easy for parents to just grasp at any strange, weird uh, possible treatment. They hear something, they're, they're so desperate for help, so they try it. And again and again and again, they're going down uh, dead ends. And um, you know, one of the families I worked with used to be a big thing back in the mid nineties, Landau-Kleffner syndrome. And I don't know if you'd even ever heard it, but it was really hot for a couple of years and kids were getting steroid treatment. We're working with this little boy and um, he's um, making some progress in early intervention. So they try the steroid treatment and you know, all of a sudden he's puffed up like a balloon and it's not having any effect on his uh, behavior and his development. Um, but many parents just went ahead, okay, full-time steroids for my little preschooler. And that's just one, at the association, we keep a list of all of the unproven treatments that parents have been uh, susceptible to adopting. And we're over 500 different treatments, lots of things that sound totally outrageous to anybody who's not worried about their kids, so like bleach therapy. Um, why would I be trying to use bleach to cure my child's autism? But somebody told me it was a good idea. And, and even so many of the drugs, people are trying any drug they can possibly get their hands on without any evidence whatsoever that it helps uh, autism, but I'll, I'll try it. So there's this huge, the benefit of parent leadership is they know what they're looking for. And the weakness of parent leadership is they don't necessarily know what the method is that's going to accomplish their goals. So they're, and most people just are influenced socially. And I think it's a big problem we have in the world today. People are on social media influenced socially. They're not conducting a scientific controlled study and they don't even know how to do that. They don't have the resources to do that. So they're they're just going with what somebody told them. Well, how long ago was it? I mean, it must have been, oh gosh, 15, 20 years ago when the National Standards Project came out where they started looking at some of the evidence-based care for the first time. Um, but I don't even know. I mean, what's your gestalt on that? Is, is, are families actually accessing that versus being able to go to the web and, and Google, hey, what, what's, what can I do? What is the new treatment for autism? Or I mean, where do you see the balance of that? And who should be disseminating some of this information? Well, again, you know, again, talking about uh, the one of the major problems we face in the world today is social media. It's no longer parents going and researching from their side, 
they're being fed stuff. So they happen to text about autism and all of a sudden they're getting fed information from some artificial intelligence uh, source that's matching up what their search history is. And again, I'm not saying they're, they're even looking for treatment yet, but whatever buzzwords they're using, social media, AI metrics are uh, matching them up with whatever seems to be popular. You've got like computers, I guess, advising parents about the treatment of their children. Um, so that's, that stuff's coming at people hard and fast more hard and more fast every day and who knows what you're going to be hearing about the um parents given a chance um and a lot of the very responsible parents i've worked with they do want to research the um the most authoritative information they do want to look at these national standards projects and the different resources we have available. Again, we have quite a few at our Association for Science and Autism Treatment website. Um, they do want to hear what's authoritative, but somehow they've got to stop listening to all the stuff that's just being fed to them automatically from social media and set that aside long enough to go look for something responsible. And I mean, do you feel like, I mean, looking you, for a needle in a haystack? Sorry. No, for sure. I, but that, you, yeah. I mean, you mentioned parents are going through this. Hey, how often do you feel like, you know, policymakers are hearing the same sorts of things as far as, well, we should be doing this? Or, you know what? I just saw this come out the other day. And why aren't we putting more of our finances towards this treatment? Because it'll cost us less. Or, I mean, is there a lot of that going on at that level where there needs to be more of an impetus from the uh, from the behavioral health community, from uh, practitioners, from behavioral development of pediatricians, from psychologists, from behavior analysts to be able to make sure that the policymakers understand what's current in our field and are informing them the right ways so that the wrong policy doesn't trickle down? Right. Yeah, you know, so that a major challenge we have is applied behavior analysis was so successful and started making an impact in the 1960s that led to the deinstitutionalization movement and then ongoing showing the promise of treatment with kids because it set aside large group research and focused on what's right for this particular child. What does, where is this child today? What are the parents' goals? What are they trying to accomplish? And let's research whether this even works for this particular child. And that was mind opening for families. They actually could see the effectiveness of the intervention with their child. And they were seeing, and I'm talking about home-based treatment where parents are involved, they're right there while we're evaluating the effectiveness of our intervention. They're seeing us go through the problem solving and troubleshooting until we arrive at the specific reinforcers and methods that actually work for their own child. Mm -hmm. And so it's no longer what does the Surgeon General tell me I should be doing? But look, this is really working. I know what's working for my child. And the power of applied behavior analysis is it gives us objective ways to analyze, does this really work for your child, rather than just trust to uh, a government report? The problem with that is what the government wants is more like cost effectiveness data. They want to say, okay, so if we treated 100 kids with ABA and another 100 kids with um, steroids, which is going to be more beneficial? And that's not applied behavior analysis research. And it's it actually relies on <clears throat> 
those kinds of studies rely on statistically finding small differences between two groups. So the, um, the steroid treatment group maybe made 1% gain on a measure of intellectual functioning and the ABA treatment group made a 12% gain as a group on measures of intellectual functioning. Okay, so ABA is more cost effective than steroid once we add in the cost of the two treatments. But for each individual family, some of those kids weren't benefiting from the ABA they got. Some of those kids did seem to be benefiting from the steroid treatment they got. And those families know what they really want. Um, the government's more making, again, kind of a cold cost accounting decision that's not really looking at what's in the best interests of the individual child. No, so, it's, it's, it is tough though. I mean, it's, it, it, they are looking for that though, and it doesn't stop them from looking at that. And one of the hard things that, that I think you very well are articulated is ABA as, as a science is focused on the individual. And when you're applying it within the field, it's you're looking at really understanding what's going to be meaningful for that individual client and how to be able to adapt the environment appropriately around them. Finding outcome studies that are looking at, you know, gains across this very broad population has been hard to come by. We've been able to do it with certain studies and replicate that. But being able to justify that over the years is, I think, where policymakers are having their, their challenge, is that they're seeing this new emerging research that's being done on smaller sets of, of clients without control groups as well, because I don't know if that's super ethical not to give a child treatment if they are needing treatment. But that's, I think, the challenge that they're running into. It's, it's how do I measure this? I mean, what are the outcome studies that you'd be saying, you know, if we're looking at the science of ABA for treatment for autism, these are these are well-founded studies that show that the techniques are valuable, they work, and now it's up to the clinician to understand how much I need to be able to provide of each technique, how much intensity I need to be able to apply for each one of these clients on an individual level. What research do you reflect back on? Yeah, and what um, what level of implementation do I need to put in place to replicate what that research study is showing? So there's a number of high quality research studies um, that were conducted in the past 20 years of intensive early intervention using the general ABA and LOVAS uh, models, and they were all done under the controlled conditions with high quality uh, treatment controls. So we knew we needed to be training the staff up to a certain level. We needed to have in place sufficient staff to deliver the services. And uh, we needed to have regular measures of the child's progress and in a regular system of immediate review and treatment modification. And all those were in place in the research studies. So then an organization says, okay, well, we're going to do that. So then they just hire people off the street, hire maybe one uh, clinician who has some training from one of those research sites. And then they try to just build a program out of thin air and all the quality features are just missing. So they're really not replicating the results of that the research tells us is possible. They're, they're doing something important, which is they're providing access to families, but they're almost immediately discounting the need for quality. And we've just seen this again and again and again. And whether you want to bring in issues of uh, profiteering or not, um, a nonprofit organization or a profit or a motivated organization, they're still struggling with the same problem of how am I going to put together a program where none exists? How am I going to provide all the training? 
and meet the needs of these families from day one, and they often fall short. Um, then the funders have a reason, the government payers at Medicare or the uh, or Medicaid or the uh, insurance companies or the public schools, they have a reason to say, oh, so this isn't really working out too well. Our measures of that we're expecting our providers to uh, collect, they don't seem to be that impressive, but they're often ignoring the fact, well, they're not paying for the level of quality that the research studies um, have been enjoyed. And then there is that organizational responsibility that you're talking about. It's, you know, what goes back to the funder are the reports of, you know, this is what the effect of treatment was over this period of time. Um, they're hopefully looking at that to see that, you know, hey, what I paid for is showing some of the progress and the goals that that organization thought they'd be able to meet. But if we run into situations where we're not adequately staffing, we're not providing the amount of hours that we initially thought that that client would need, um, that, we're, that we're going through so much attrition that we're, we don't have qualified staff all the time. Those things will have results to them that are going to lower the quality that you were describing. And so I do think there's an organizational responsibility to that. Um, and I think that's something that we can do better at, but there's also, there's a variety of research questions I think that we always need to be asking. Um, when you look about the, the research that we rely on, culturally, we don't have a lot of that information over time. It was, it was a very small subset of our overall population being represented there. So having some of that research guides on treatment. Um, the settings, we've changed the settings and the delivery of treatment over time, and having more research on that is so valuable. But there's this gap right now. It's like, what are we calling research? What are we actually looking at for informing our decisions? How do we know that it's been validated? And you've done a lot of really good kind of work on informing others and helping this dialogue to occur. So how do we balance the emerging information, which we do need, with the application on a broader scale when it comes to policy or when it comes to setting a new standard of this is what we need to be doing if we're utilizing this setting. Um, how do you how do you kind of balance those factors of new emerging research with understanding when it's valuable for us? Mm -hmm. Well, I really I really think in terms of the laboratory model. Um, so whether we're talking about medical research with drugs or with uh, surgery or vitamins or whatever, we start out in science, we start out with studying in the laboratory. We're not really looking at, um, is this going to result in widespread improvements for society? We're just looking, does this even actually have an effect? Does this, if I use this drug, if I give this drug to a mouse, is it gonna change their behavior? And once I've got something that actually seems to do something, now I the next step is to move into developing this into a program of services. And then the next step is evaluating that service delivery model. So, you know, center-based versus home-based care, school-based um, versus round year-round services, um, these basic levels of service delivery, what level of quality control, what level of staff training, what level of credentials should staff have, these service features are going to affect how much impact what was discovered in the lab actually has. But if you start off with a a black box of, I don't even know if this works. So we're going to start off by first um, gearing up and serving 100 kids. And then we'll we'll study, we'll compare those 100 kids with this drug and with another 100 kids without the drug, without even knowing if the drug is has shows any potential in the laboratory. Uh, we've put the um, 
cart way before the horse. I think that might be an appropriate metaphor, but the mm -hmm. um, we really need to do the research in the lab first. And what applied behavior analysis allows us to do is forget about whether we're talking about reinforcement or a certain method of language instruction. It allows us, or a drug, um, behavior analysis focusing on an individual is, does this individual respond to this intervention? And once we see that this intervention has a similar effect with, sim with other individuals with similar needs, now we can start fashioning it into a service delivery system. So families came to me, you know, another big issue that uh, is always a concern of families is, should I be using a gluten-free, casein-free diet with my child? And in the laboratory, we know that certain people have uh, dietary responses that really affect them. Some people really can't tolerate wheat and other people can. So does that really affect autism? So we've started off in the laboratory, we know that um, weed allergies are a thing. So now let's study on purpose some kids with autism. And what we're gonna find is the majority of kids with autism, weed is not an issue for them. It doesn't help them to put them on this certain diet. But for a very small percentage of kids, they react just like you or I would if we had a weed allergy. It really affects their behavior. And um, at that small group ABA level, let's compare, the, okay, let's take him off of wheat for a month. Now let's give him wheat again. Oh, look, we can really tell, boy, he reacts like crazy to wheat. It's obvious this is important to him. Um, but now to turn this into a large scale intervention that's blind to the individual assessments and the individual needs, um, it turns into something that's not cost effective for the government. Um, but ABA allows us to look kid by kid. Well, let's see, your kid's got serious digestive problems and he's got autism. So let's look at the diet for your kid. So. Applied behavior analysis doesn't require us to reject out of hand things that don't necessarily make sense. But what it's asking us to do is, well, let's look and see if it actually matters to your kid. Yeah, and I, I mean, each one of these pieces that you're talking about has, you know, we've we've validated that, you know, gluten-free diets are helpful for those who have gluten intolerance. So on an individual level, we apply that to a, to a child, and then this is a medical model. Same thing with ABA, I would imagine, is that we're looking at, we know that the practice is effective. Now it comes down to which techniques within that practice, what intensity within that practice, how we deliver that care that becomes important. So when you're talking on a, on a policy level, and I kind of want to go back to just, you know, if I were talking to a policymaker right now, would I be looking at trying to say, you know, ABA has to be done in this number of hours or else it'll never be effective or what i'm saying is aba has been demonstrated effective over decades the clinician needs to have the flexibility like in any other medical practice to be able to give the care in the way that it needs to benefit that client because they know that client well and the whole principle of medical necessity would be that client with the physician or with the clinician care model. Is that is that the discrepancy that we're talking about right now is like we're trying to get this narrow bucket and have a very definitive language where we're now we're almost forgetting about the individual? That's a, yeah, I think you're really framing the, the quandary well now, helping me even think through the, the point here is the parameters of treatment are things that we study as much as the actual uh, stimulus that we're using. So we might say, so you need to be using positive reinforcement, which we obviously would normally be saying, but it's not M&Ms for every child. It's reinforcement. It's the way that reinforcement's delivered 
for the individual. And we may find, you know, your neighbor, food is not a reinforcer for your child, for their child, but food is a major reinforcer for your child. But it's not just that kind of a black and white question. It's what's the schedule of reinforcement? So if I overuse food, all I'm doing is, is increasing the child's weight and I'm using non-nutritional -nutri foods and they're not even the right reinforcers and the schedule is all wrong. And so ABA is studying what's the right schedule? What's the effective reinforcer? How often should it be used in order to say motivate uh, requests and uh, expressive labeling for this particular child? And now what's the schedule of fading out that overuse of reinforcement to make it realistic? And this whole, that whole process, all the numbers, the frequency of training trials, the frequency of generalization activities, those are all individualized. And one child ends up responding really quickly with only 10 hours a week of follow through with reinforcement. And another child requires 70 hours a week of follow through with reinforcement. And it's the parameters that are individualized and end up being the cost effective parameters. We don't wanna say every child should be getting 40 hours, it's 40 hours or nothing. We wanna say it's the level of intervention that's right for each individual child. And when we remember it's, it's all about social validity, it's all about what's right in the eyes of the child's parents. Um, one parent's trying to increase the rate of language and another parent, that's not their issue. They're concerned about toilet training. And so now we've not just modified the parameters to accomplish the same goal, but we've got different goals for different kids that each come with different parameters based upon that child's baseline levels of functioning and that child's resources. And ABA allows us to be that focused and that individualized and in the end be cost effective. We're not over treating a child that doesn't need it. And we're not under treating and failing with a child who needs much more. So then we come back to where you were starting earlier is so government then is in a ham handed way saying, okay, so everything's going to be 32 hours a week. And if uh, this program doesn't deliver 32 hours, then we're withdrawing their funding because every child has to get 32 hours because that's what research tells us. Um, they're making a big mistake. The, um, mm -hmm. They need to be instituting standards that conform with what's right for the individual child and what's effective for the individual child, both in terms of the actual kinds of stimulation and the parameters of service delivery. Absolutely. And, and, and I think that that's the question that I'd love for you to kind of walk through is, so we have this, this amount of research that's coming through. We have the historical research. It all leads to establishing very strong standards of care, which are, you know, the, the practical components of are you actually looking at these criteria and are you evaluating these? Are you delivering care within this structure? It's not telling you what technique to do at specific times. So it's not telling you exactly how many hours you need to do for a specific child. But what's the process right now of taking that research and moving it into, I can expect that this would be the standard of care I'd be looking at from an organization. And speaking to a policymaker, speaking to a parent, how would you kind of walk through that path? Well, for us, and this is kind of another conundrum in public policy, for us, the focus has been on evaluation and treatment planning. And we started with, after working it all out over a period of 30 years um, in more of our institutional based research projects, we learned you really have to spend a lot of time evaluating this specific child, where they are right now, 
what are the interventions that they needed? What are the parameters? What are the levels of implementation that they need? And then what's the rate at which you can phase out the intensive treatment towards less? And what are the, the actual needs and goals of the individual family? And so we put our effort into making sure we really understand what this family really wants, what they're, they're actually willing to accept, um, what are they motivated to go the extra mile to do, um, what's really right by this family and by this child, and um, are we delivering what's right for that child and this family this month? And that brings the quality. If I'm able to be covered for uh, cost-wise, I'm paid to do the intensive evaluation and mutual treatment planning with the family. It's the structures, the limits of the billing codes match up with what I really need to do to do a good job of evaluating the child and coordinating with the family to be responsive to their goals then I can deliver a cost-effective service. But ironically, all along, the payers have wanted to cut short on the assessment and evaluation and treatment planning costs and focus on the cold one-to-one -one delivery of services as what their major focus of funding is. And, um, even um, even today, in in Minnesota, our Medicaid program has seen the light again not under the leadership of many parents. Our Medicaid early intervention program, our the policy head is a parent. Um, they get it, and they've been focusing on making sure we are covered for the costs of evaluation and treatment planning, so we can customize to each individual child. Mm -hmm. But then, and that's Minnesota, but then we have a family in Nebraska and the Medicaid program doesn't reach there. So they're being covered by a commercial insurance plan that doesn't want to cover the costs of assessment and treatment plan. Yeah, now I find that funny as I see that same conundrum, Eric, is that, I mean, you're seeing where you're seeing arbitrary decisions being made on um, the oversight to the delivery of care, to the evaluation of whether or not I'm actually achieving the goals and making those modifications and the time that's needed to do some of that work. And even the parent component of, am I bringing stakeholders involved so that the care carries over? I'm seeing arbitrary limits on that almost as much as I'm seeing it on the recommendation of that direct service. and. It, it does bring about, you know, where, what is the research? What are we actually looking at? And I think it goes back to the research shows ABA works. Now the medical model would say we provide it in the appropriate quantity of each of these services to be able to meet the goals that have been outlined. And the clinician should know that and the family should commit to it. Um, is there is there any safeguard that you think needs to be put in place? I mean, because there are probably a lot of programs out there not doing it right, that maybe are not providing the care in the way that it should be designed and aren't making progress with clients that deserve progress to be made simply because they're they're not able to apply the care in the way that it should be done. And that's a problem in itself. But are there safeguards that need to be in place for that? Well, again, it's kind of a if you build it, they'll come problem. It's the every provider would be happy to deliver the right amount of assessment and treatment planning if they can afford to do so. And um, they're paying their staff. They're either paying their staff on an hourly basis or on an expectation of a productivity basis. And if the insurance company is refusing to cover the level of cost of the assessment and treatment planning and parent engagement activities, then what's going to happen? Are, are people are cutting corners on 
the essential aspect of treatment, which is individualize, thoroughly evaluate what the child really needs, engage the family in treatment planning, and make sure we're doing right by the child instead of you know, forcing a round peg into a square hole. And if that's the focus of any policy in whether it's a state Medicaid program or whether it's a TRICARE or whether it's a commercial insurance plan, if their focus is on, we wanna make sure you can thoroughly evaluate what this child really needs and then design the treatment parameters around what they really need then that's going to be a more cost-effective model and you're going to have much less of the families feeling like, gee, this is all about the money. They're just, they're requiring us to do a certain number of hours because that's what they're paid for. And without the families realizing, yeah, because they're not paid to engage you in treatment planning. And, but if they were paid to engage you in treatment planning, then you would have a more satisfying service delivery model for your own child. Yeah, so it's almost impossible to separate all these factors. Um, but to go full circle, you started our conversation with talking about the power of the family in the process. And parents do want to stay up to date on what is latest in the, the I guess, the validated research within ABA therapy so they can make sure they're asking the questions of their providers or advocating at the policy level or being able to go to appeals with an insurance company if they have to um, and self-advocate. Um, where can parents go to make sure they're getting access to the most updated information so that they can have these conversations and these dialogues um, with providers and policymakers and everybody involved in their child's life? Well, again, I, um, I'm a voluntary president of the Association for Science and Autism Treatment. There's um, we have a, a large number of professional volunteers donating their work to summarizing current research results and posting them on our website and our monthly newsletter. Um, you can uh, get a lot of information there. Um, and there's other programs, you know, like the Council of Autism Service Providers is uh, parent-led, no, no surprise, uh, parent-led provider organization is making sure that it's you're able to access information you need about what's best for your children and uh, their initiatives um, for credentialing from the, the Behavior Analyst Certification Board is um, provider-led, but very much influenced by parents. Um, there's a lot of ABA organizations that are really trying to make sure you can get information that you need. And then state by state, the um, every state has advocates. Uh, Medicaid's required to have a uh, legal aid system that provides legal advocacy to parents to make sure they're able to access the right level of services. And in some states, those advocacy organizations are very aggressive um, and in others they're um, very weak and those parents are more disadvantaged uh, but you can certainly going back to that needle in the haystack problem is the haystacks being thrown at you and somehow you got to notice that one needle that's also coming at you across the internet um, you can certainly, um, and we'll post, I'm sure with the, this podcast, we'll post some websites and resources that people can go to, uh, to try to focus in and look for the needle um, amongst all of the straw being thrown down their throats. But it's, I, I sympathize with parents today. No, for sure. I mean, it's it's easy to get excited about something new, something that provides hope. Um, but with each of those things, that they they have to have some evidence supporting them before they can be applied at that level. And it's not just parents. I I would imagine the efforts that you've put in 
to be able to kind of bring about some of these discussions and a lot of the resources that are out there, they're helpful for physicians as well. I mean, they're helpful for the pediatric network to understand and to be able to evaluate what's being recommended out there and to have those conversations and for them to go look at some of these articles and journals to be able to understand more. So I appreciate all that you've done, Eric, and and uh, I know that you volunteer at these other organizations, but I appreciate your volunteering to, to be a part of the podcast as well and to share your time with me. So. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Jeff. Always happy to talk to you. You're so insightful. Thank you for listening to Autism Weekly. We hope you tune back in next week to learn more about autism in the real world. Autism Weekly is now found on all the major listening apps, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. Subscribe to be notified when we post a new podcast. Autism Weekly is produced by ABS Kids. ABS Kids is proud to provide diagnostic assessments and ABA therapy to children with developmental delays like autism spectrum disorder. You can learn more about ABS Kids and the Autism Weekly podcast by visiting abskids.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you again next week.